we brought Barney, and we are delighted to have a relationship with David Smith, his economics advisor, who was kind enough to make our case to Barney, because of an event that took place 15 years ago here that he may not remember. But um, it's something of an internal legend here at the Institute. Back in 97, we were all still fighting about whether or not NAFTA had been good or bad, and we were moving on to permanent normal trade relations for China, among other hot trade issues. And at one point, Congressman Frank came over here for a talk, and he said something, this is not an exact quote, but I have three witnesses who claim it's pretty close. Um, look, globalization's all nice and good, free trade's all nice and good, I get it. But my people are getting screwed, and I'm gonna hold globalization hostage until you give me the social welfare that I want. And this was a very important challenge to us. And even in market economics terms, it's not, as we heard discussed in our first panel this morning, it's not unreasonable. It has been a, a light motif, as it were, of the Institute's work, Howard Rosen, among many others, Fred Bergsten, Kim Elliott when she was here, about the idea that part of the point is you compensate the people who are disrupted by trade. And as Danny Roderick was among the first to point out, the more globalized an economy you have, in general, the larger a welfare state you have, the larger a safety net you have. And we're now wrestling with the implications of this for China going forward. Can they build out their safety net? The US, will we continue to be an outlier without a safety net of sorts? And so for us, there was nobody better than Congressman Frank to come provoke us into thinking further about these issues, especially we're honored to say this is his first public speech since leaving office, I personally hope only temporarily, um, and to go forward from there. Just a personal note, um, I grew up in Brookline, Massachusetts, which is a part of Congressman Frank's district. And the only political campaign I ever worked on, because I'm now a strenuously nonpartisan person, um, was in 1982 when Congressman Frank was redistricted against the incumbent Republican in Massachusetts, Peg Heckler. Um, and of course, Congressman Frank won that race and every single race since. But what I think is something we could all agree is, ah, for the days when Peg Heckler represented the Republican Party in the House uh, in terms of the kinds of moderate economic policies that she was espousing. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Congressman Frank. As I said at the start, we're here to hear his remarks on today's topics. Anything to do with those, you're welcome to talk about. The senatorial matter, he will be available after the lunch starting at 2.15 to take questions. Our press, our press liaison, Ryan Reel, will take people who want to discuss that. Congressman Frank. Thank you, Adam. That was a uh, very generous introduction. I have only one regret, and I had thought maybe before I retired I would get the answer to the question, because you did say that you would introduce me without further ado, and I have for years wondered what further ado would look like. <laughs> it had always been an ambition. In my mind, it involved a man on a unicycle <laughs> juggling plates and playing a trombone, but I don't know what, uh, what others would do with it. And I appreciate your reference to the Margaret Heckler race. And by the way, I am here in Congress today because of an early forerunner, I was a week ago, because of an early forerunner of a phenomenon we've now seen, which is the influence within the Republican Party of people who are very conservative. Margaret Heckler was a moderate Republican from Massachusetts. And then came the Reagan budget. And she was under enormous pressure to vote for the Reagan budget. This is chronicled in uh, uh, one of the Reagan biographies, I think, by Richard Reeves. And as a result of voting for the Reagan budget, she lost the support she'd had from elderly groups, community action groups, union groups, municipal officials, and others. And the race that I'd expected to lose uh, became one that I, that I won. Now, as I said, that was a, an early part of that phenomenon. It has now increased greatly. And it's part of what I want to talk about. And I appreciate your reference to 97. Yes, I 
got deeply involved in international economics by choice. Uh, when I joined the Banking Committee, as it was then called, in 1981, I did it because of my interest in housing and urban issues. And I found that it had jurisdiction over the international financial institutions. Somewhat illogically, in the Senate, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the other regional development banks, which really implicate American foreign policy much more than American banking, are in the jurisdiction of the Committee on Foreign Relations. Uh, because the title, the word bank is in them, literally, I think that's probably all that was there, the clerk put the World Bank and the other regional banks as they grew up into the Banking Committee. And uh, it is an anomaly of which I became quite fond. And, strongly defended because my choice when I was able to be a chairman of a subcommittee was to take over the one that had the international financial institutions. And I'm very proud of some of the work we did and it, it, it basically is an example of the viewpoint I've had that Adam talked about and I think one of the successes. When I took over as chair of that subcommittee, we were in the midst of what some of you will remember as the 50 years is enough campaign when there was a very large, very popular movement in America on the left to collapse, not just have America withdraw, but to defund the World Bank, the IMF, and the other institutions. It was partly conspiratorial in nature, but it was partly based on attitudes. And it, it came to a climax during the Asian debt crisis when there was what I believe to be inappropriate pressure on the Asian government to deal with budget deficits, which were not the cause of the problem, rather than the liquidity issues. And there was the famous picture of Michel Kamdesu, arms folded, standing over the president of, uh, of Indonesia as a cover, I guess, of Newsweek or Time, and that was not very helpful. One of the things that I am very proud of is that that is no longer the case. Uh, the left-wing opposition to those institutions has largely dissolved in substantial part because they have evolved themselves. The World Bank, for example, has a great set of institutions which enforce environmental sensitivity. There's an inspection panel, there's openness, there's a whole range of things that is helpful. And I felt particularly vindicated to be a little modest. I know, you know, one of the people tell me the lies in daily life. Um, one lie which I no longer have to tell is, oh, I love to campaign. I actually never said it. Campaigning, if you listen to someone tells you how much he or she likes campaigning for office, you're probably listening to either a liar or a psychopath. It is really <laughs> a very unpleasant business. It's something you do, and I did it for 40 years, but I'm happy now not to not to have to do it. But one thing that everybody tends to lie about is to say, oh, I don't like to say, I told you so. Now, in my experience, not only does everybody like to say, I told you so, <laughs> it is one of the few pleasures that clearly improves with age. <laughs> I can now say, I told you so, without taking a pill before, after, or during the process. And what we have seen is an increased sensitivity to distributional issues which is what Adam was talking about, but also, frankly, a weakening of the, not just distribution issues, but a weakening of the notion that good economics, forgetting about distribution, was a very rigid free market approach. And as a result of that, um, there is no more 50 years than enough. Now, we've got a new problem with the bank and the IMF that I'll get into, but this, this liberal and, and, and left activism, the, any, the union of opposition, which was significant, has diminished, and the most recent favorable thing from my standpoint was the decision by the IMF explicitly to endorse the legitimacy of capital controls appropriately employed, not as a protection measure. And they said um, that, and I've been speaking actually to the Obama administration because I, I, I have argued with regard to the treaties. Again, there was an effort during the Clinton administration, the Treasury Department was proposing to make capital controls illegal and wanted to amend the IMF charter to make them illegal. And it's a nice evolution, in my judgment, both good economics and better social policy to say no. And I have been told by uh, Under Secretary Brainerd that the Obama administration, they've sent me, they're about to send me a letter, I may have sent it saying that a country which complies with the IMF's capital controls 
will not be in violation of American treaties, which, as long as they are not being done for blatantly protectionist reasons. Those things are very important. So yeah, there has been progress on the international institutions. There's been much less progress on the American side, and Adam summed it up. Uh, yes, globalization, or my viewpoint, globalization clearly creates a great deal of wealth. But I was frustrated until fairly recently by an attitude among many economists that acted as if the relevant actors in all this were countries. And yes, if you look at countries, then they're all the pluses. When you begin to look at what happens inside countries, then it becomes a different story. We are now at the point where if there is not better attention given to the distributional effects, if we don't do more to alleviate the unhappiness and frustration of a large number of people in this country, support for international economic activity, both trade and other forms of cooperation, will be in serious jeopardy. And I will tell you that during the, I think it was in 2010, I was still chairman of the committee, there was a serious effort that almost succeeded in the Senate and, and, and gave us a dilemma to say that if the IMF continued to participate in efforts to alleviate the European crisis, the United States government would pull out. And we were able, frankly, to kind of neutralize that in the House, not by a direct vote. I was afraid to bring it to a vote. But it was a case where we, appropriately, we didn't hide it from people, but we didn't volunteer the information. I will tell you that's basically, I have two definitions for an honest, uh, honest approach in politics based empirically on how people behave. The honest people are the ones who tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. For the whole truth, you sometimes need a subpoena. Um, <laughs> the other is my view of what elected officials should do, people who make laws. Uh, I don't know anybody who obeys every law, but I do believe that at, at the minimum, you should obey every law that you vote for. And I think that's a reasonable standard to which you can hold people. But um, we had to work hard and maneuver a little bit to prevent the Republicans from initiating a successful move to cut off American participation with the IMF. And now, by the way, with the Republicans in control of the House, that is a current dilemma, trying to figure out a way. And by the way, this is not a budgetary issue because the way it works with the IMF, it doesn't, even Congressional Budget Office, which is hardly lax, they do not charge us with any uh, liability because we put the money in reserve, people borrow against it, the IMF borrows against it, they pay it back, they get all that gold, we're, we're pretty secure. But there is still this, as I said, the, the, the left-wing opposition in the bank and elsewhere has diminished. One, there was one thing, the World Bank has a uh, report they compile annually called Doing Business, in which they rate you on doing business. And there was a period when Saudi Arabia looked much better than Sweden by their criteria, quite literally, because things like vacations and decent wages and, and health care were considered obstacles to the ease of doing business. There were some legitimate things about how hard it was to get permits and corruption, and we've done work, the ILO participated, and there has been a substantial revision, uh, which we worked on in Congress, and a lot of the NGOs worked with us in the AFL-CIO, and we have made a substantial revision so that that is no longer uh, the negative factor. So I think, we have been able to, to, to build support more on the liberal side for these institutions by their evolving in ways that I think are both better socially and I would think with regard to capital controls, better economically. I think a view of the Asian crisis that said it was just wild overspending and not talking about the flows of hot money, that, that, that was wrong, that we got, it, we got it right. So now the question is, where are we today? I uh, hope to write a book, and one of the things that I want to address is the attitude towards government. Uh, I believe my fellow liberals make a great mistake, and others too, by joining in the denunciation of government. It is now the case, by and large, that the politically easiest course is to talk about how much you don't like government. 
you then pivot into an admiration of various government policies. But that doesn't work too well. You should not be surprised if you have gotten elected to office and have spent all your time denouncing government when you then turn around and propose an expansion of a government activity in a certain area, people say, well, that's government. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do that. I mean, it gets, after a while, I guess one of the things that is an example of this is if a program has been around long enough to become popular, it somehow gets dissociated from being government. I mean, it's literally the case that we were told during the healthcare debate, keep government out of Medicare. I mean, this is not <laughs> apocryphal. All of us have seen those signs and, uh, and heard those things. Uh, uh, actually, I will tell you that if you talk about America, by far the most popular form of medical care in America, administered by anybody, with the consumers of that medical care, is a form of socialized medicine. And I'm not talking about Medicare. I'm talking about all-out socialized medicine. It's the medical care given by the Department of Veterans Affairs. And if you go into a VA hospital, you enter a government building and a government doctor tells you to lay in a government bed and a government nurse sticks a needle in you. Um, it is socialized medicine. It is wildly popular with the people who, uh, who, who deal with it. But it doesn't stop people from saying we don't, I mean there are people who've been going to the VA and loving it and who will fiercely defend it and make us keep open VA facilities when some of the administration want to shut them down who say, but we don't want any government medical care. I mean, I, I think what part of this problem is that we have to make government more, more acceptable in general, but in particular, but you don't do that just by, by uh, verbal gymnastics. Um, I am struck often by uh, people who agree with me who say, gee, you guys can't get this passed. Why don't you say this? Why don't you say that? Uh, well, the answer is often, yeah, we've been saying it, and then they say the other, and the media doesn't take it. I mean, I, there's a certain amount of uh, rhetorical shadow boxing people engage in, where they one-sidedly deliver all these wonderful rhetorical knockout punches, and then wonder why we're not equally successful when we have real opponents. But um, it is important, I think, first of all morally, but also strategically for the su survival of, of an international economic framework of cooperation to do a better job of sharing the benefits of that and of alleviating these problems. Now, we've got ourselves in a bind because there is a debt, not, I believe, as uh, implicitly doomsday uh, in its impact as some, but it is clear we're going to have to diminish it. And so this is the dilemma. What do you do? How do you preserve American support for things that are in our international interests, our, our, our economic interests through international cooperation? And that is both trade and the uh, question of uh, the international institutions. By the way, an aside, a, uh, th there is a, well, I mean, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, and I'll get to that in a second. The basic thing is that we have got to find a better way to give the average American a sense that things are working for him or her in real terms. And to some extent that costs money and how do you do it? And I will tell you what, what I come to um, and have been arguing this for some time, but now I think it is absolutely essential. If we do not acknowledge the importance of a reduction in America's worldwide military commitments. There is no way we will be able to meet the legitimate needs for a social safety net at home, for a better sharing of the profits of globalization, uh, and still get the debt down. If you talk about increasing military spending, if you set an arbitrary GDP figure or whatever, then you bring down the debt only at the cost of essentially restricting any effort to improve the quality of life in the United States. And I sometimes I get it backwards. I was reading an article the other day of people saying, well, it was in the New York Times, um, people are worried about America's debt because the debt will keep us from playing this major role in international affairs. Well, it kind of gets it backwards. Uh, the major role in international affairs is a, a substantial reason for the debt. Over the past 10 years, I checked the statistic, 
we spent 50% more on the military than we did on Medicare. People talk about what's growing the debt, and I get frustrated with this. The biggest single increase in our national expenditures and its contribution to the debt in the current century are the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and the buildup that has accompanied them. People may not be fully aware, but we budget the Pentagon the way some of you would pay for your lawyer. Um, that is, you have them on retainer, but then if they have to go to court, you pay extra. Um, the Pentagon is on a very large retainer, and then when we go to war, there's an extra budget for the war. And the retainer is, of course, bigger because you, you, you need that. Um, we were spending, at some points, over $700 billion a year on wars. We are still spending more than we need. And I think, and I understand there's an argument, well, this is our international obligation. I, I have two verbal differences with the last two Democratic presidents for whom I have great admiration and, and whom I was very proud to support in Congress. For Bill Clinton, I thought his worst moment was when he said in a State of the Union speech, the era of big government is over. I asked one of his people when that was, because I apparently slept through it. I don't remember when we had the era of big government. But this, this notion that government is a bad thing is a bad thing, because it disables you from doing things which we need to have done that only government can do. Obviously, there are things we need done that only the private sector can do. But there are things we need to do together with pooled resources, and that's called government. I mean, I, I wish you could not be allowed to say, I shrunk government. I think you should, I mean, I'm a great believer in free speech, so I can't enforce this. But I wish you had to say, I made the fire department smaller. There will be fewer roads paved because of me. Because that's what people are talking about when they talk about cutting government. And I think, you know, now, if there's something you don't like, if you've got fewer ethanol subsidies, fine, you can say that. But you should have to be specific about what it is that you reduce. And in my case, I believe that there are several areas of excess. And I, I, I didn't bring it with me, I forgot, but I, there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal on the Wednesday after the election from a man who'd been uh, an assistant secretary of defense in the Bush administration and someone who had been the uh, head of the Air Force, uh, the Aerospace Industries Association. And they were criticizing the Obama administration for not doing more to build up the Air Force. And this is the mentality. It said, and I'm, I'm giving you the exact sense of it, I don't have it verbatim. They said, the Air Force has been a victim of its successes in not getting enough money to meet our worldwide needs. It is true, the article said, that no American has been killed by enemy air power since 1953. And America has completely dominated the airspace over every battlefield in which we have been engaged since that time. But that's not good enough. We have to be able to provide humanitarian aid elsewhere, and in particular, Americans' air force must be ready to respond to any trouble spot anywhere in the world at any time. That is a literal quote. And that's just the Air Force, by the way. Well, I, maybe they meant together. Um, because you do know that while the Air Force is by far the largest Air Force in the world, the second largest Air Force in the world is the Navy. Um, <laughs> taken together, uh, we have an enormous degree of power. And it's true, people are worried about potential opponents. We do have, uh, I'm sure some of you are aware that China just got its first aircraft carrier which is a ship it bought from Ukraine and, re, uh, and retrofitted. And actually, a month ago, they were able to land their first airplane on their retrofitted Ukrainian uh, aircraft carrier. Now, I don't like the Chinese government, and I want to be able to protect ourselves. The fact is, we, we far overdo this. And this is where the president, President Obama, uh, and I disagree, he has said America is the indispensable nation. No, that's, we cannot afford to be. We cannot afford to be the nation that is there for every trouble spot everywhere. I would be morally conflicted if I thought that our being the indispensable nation did a lot of good. The fact is that that also assumes that we can accomplish much more than we can accomplish. For one thing, I think we fundamentally misunderstand what a military can do. We have a superb military, wonderful people, and they do great things, and they are well equipped. But a military is good at stopping bad things from happening. A military cannot make good things happen. It cannot bring together Kurds and Shia and Sunni. It cannot end corruption. 
It cannot deal with bigoted attitudes towards women. And it's particularly the case because America carries a baggage that others don't carry. It's unfair, but it's a fact. There are other countries that can do better. Um, we continue, and, and there, are, there are comparisons, our percentage of gross domestic product going to military is roughly twice the non-U.S. NATO average. Um, part of that is because they can rely on us. I mean, I Harry Truman was a great man, and the decision to send troops into Europe in 1949 was a great decision. We had weak and poor nations after World War II in Central and Western Europe, confronted by the brutality of Stalin. And while Russia had been impoverished by that war, he was able to put everything in the military. And so to keep Stalin and his troops off the backs of the Western and Central Europeans, we sent in American troops. Western and Central Europe is now quite prosperous. Stalin is dead, his successes have collapsed. One element hasn't changed, we're still there. And we're still there for no good reason. Um, and it is not because that's the best jumping off point to places we shouldn't be going to in the first place. So, you know, I, I should be very I, I want America to be the strongest nation in the world. Some of my liberal friends say that's xenophobic, but I want us to be the strongest nation in the world when I look particularly at the other candidates to be the strongest nation in the world. I mean, I, if Denmark could be the strongest nation in the world, I would feel very comfortable. That would be fine. <laughs> but they can't handle it. So uh, you look at the other candidates, it's got to be us. But we can be the strongest nation in the world much, uh, at much less cost. To get the nuclear treaty with the Soviets ratified in 2010, Barack Obama and the Senate, and they were extorted into it because they needed two-thirds, had to agree to billions more for uh, safeguarding and testing nuclear weapons. We have more nuclear weapons than we need. Look, we, we are still ready to defeat the Soviet Union in an all-out thermonuclear war. And we have a triad of ways to deliver it. We have intercontinental ballistic missiles, MIRV nuclear submarines, and the strategic air command. I have a serious proposal. I want to go to the Pentagon and say, you know those three ways you have to defeat the Soviet Union? Pick two. Give up one. We would save billions of dollars uh, by giving up one of those, still maintain capacity elsewhere. The point is that if we do not scale back this notion that America must be ready to go everywhere and defend everybody, I, well, maybe so again, somewhat controversial, I, I welcome a Japanese rearmament. I do not think that the Japanese race is inherently scarred with some virus that led to World War II. And I think it does make sense, given our concern for this now very democratic nation of Japan, to build up its military so that not all of the burden of defending Japan goes on the American taxpayer, disabling us from spending money on things that we ought to be doing here to improve the quality of our life. And that's not isolationism. I want to spend more fighting disease. I want to spend more on some of these economic activities. In fact, I believe that to the extent that we overspend militarily, we diminish our capacity to do important international economic and uh, other kinds of cooperation in other ways. So I would repeat what I said. I think both for its own moral sake and to continue to have in the United States a broad degree of support for international cooperation, you need to alleviate some of these distresses that we have in our economy and be better able to provide a safety net. And the single best way to do that is by reducing the extent to which America overspends militarily. Now, I said I was going to get to one more point, and it's this. While the liberal and left opposition has diminished, you now have a serious problem with the dominant forces in the Republican Party repudiating the internationalism that had marked that party. There was a very interesting op-ed piece in the New York Times about a month ago from a former assistant secretary or perhaps general counsel of the State Department blaming Obama for the failure of the Senate to ratify the Convention on People with Disabilities. He got 61 votes instead of 67, even with Bob Dole sitting on the floor of the House of the Senate. And it got only five Republican votes. And he said he acknowledges that the Republican Party has been very anti-internationalist and that a substantial number of Republicans are now suspicious of any such, uh, of, of international treaties and international cooperation. There was a race for chair of the Republican conference in the House. There was a very conservative candidate and a mainstream conservative candidate. 
Congresswoman Rogers. One of the most important points in Congresswoman Rogers' approach lately has been to get the U.S. out of the IMF. That's the more moderate position. Now, I know you're not supposed to be partisan, people say, although I think that's a great error. I think, as a once and future political scientist, that you cannot find a democratic poverty, successful, self-governing poverty in the history of the world where you didn't get political parties. Not because somebody planned them, but because they evolved, because you need some form of organizing principles. And there have been, in most democratic societies, civilized parties recognize that you need a public sector and a private sector, and they will differ as to where the line is drawn. We have a group today controlling the Republican Party who do not accept that, who, who do not believe in the need for the public sector to play a role, and that's both domestic and international. And there is a great suspicion about what's going on internationally. Um, that's got to be addressed. And I have to say here, you know, I, and I've said this to my friends in the financial service community, I know that the people in the financial service community, that we pissed them off with the reform bill. Frankly, I think they were annoyed more, less by the substance. I think we hurt their feelings. I mean this quite seriously. I just, just felt that one of the major things people want from us in public life is psychic income. They want to know that we appreciate what they do. They work hard. They, they do it not just for selfish reasons, but they feel destructive. And, and people said fat cats and don't fly in those planes and it hurt their feelings. And um, as a result, there was massive support in the financial sector and others in the business community, not all. Technology and others were, little more, were, were more moderate for the Republican Party. The problem is that the Republican Party that they supported, and this is factual, um, is trying to undermine the Federal Reserve. I believe that the Federal Reserve's policies under Bush appointee, originally Ben Bernanke, have been very constructive. Um, the House passed a bill over my objection that would have the Congress, uh, have the, the GAO um, audit the deliberations of the Open Market Committee, not just the transactions, but the actual setting of monetary policy. You'd have uh, people being gr grilled about that. Uh, they want to get rid of the IMF. Um, both the Fed and the IMF have been strongly criticized by my colleagues on the Republican side for what they've done with regard to Europe. I think what they have done with regard to Europe is to help diminish what was the greatest single threat to America's economic strength here. Uh, it hadn't cost us money, it hadn't led to inflation, but I, I'd say those are two things. Um, I look forward to going back to a time, as Adam does, when there was a legitimate debate between mainstream conservatives and mainstream liberals, both of whom recognize that the private and public sector is important, and we debate about where you draw the line and what the impact would be. But as we have, frankly, built up support on the left for some of this international activity, uh, with regard to the institutions, to get to trade, we're still going to have to do more to compensate people, but I think that's well within our grasp. Um, we need, first of all, as I said, to scale back American military spending so we are the strongest nation in the world, but maybe by a factor of six instead of 11. Um, stronger than any potential combination of enemies against us by maybe a factor of four rather than eight. I mean, the, the, the disproportions are, are, are just extraordinary. And I urge my friends in the business community to talk to their friends and say, yeah, there are legitimate debates about the minimum wage, about the level of taxation, about a lot of things. But whether or not we ought to have a Federal Reserve that's able to function uh, without this kind of conspiracy theory harping, whether or not America ought to participate in international economic activity is very important. And, and in that last thing, and I'll close with this, at risk here is what I find to be very important, and I think it's not, it's not controversial except some of my colleagues, that we have got to go forward in financial industry regulation in a internationally cooperative manner. We tried very hard to do that. During the years I was chairman of the committee, I spent more time uh, in foreign affairs than, than ever uh, with the EU, with England, with Japan, with Canada. We made great efforts to coordinate. And that is also essential. I will say, to some extent, I find my friends in the financial institutions, they come to us and say that, oh, the Volcker rule is going to drive them to England, and they tell the British that ring fencing is going to drive them to England. Um, then they tell the EU that this is going to wreck them. Uh, to some extent, their role model 
is the 14-year-old child of divorced parents who have learned to play mommy off against daddy, but that mommy and daddy talk, and we need them to understand that. I mean, this is an important part of international cooperation. I, clearly, there is a very central role for the financial institutions. Being able to enforce the kind of regulations that allow us to, the good part of that, not the bad part, is another part of international cooperation. So, just in summary, we've got to scale back America's military budget to the point where we are very secure, where we can help those that really need our help, but we do not believe that we are the indispensable nation and get called on to go everywhere to try to do everything, much of which will backfire and much of which we will make things worse. And secondly, I do think it's important for the mainstream conservative business community of America to tell the party that should be the mainstream conservative party that the extremism is dysfunctional. With that, I'll be glad to respond to any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Barney. I, I, I will stand here as a potted plant without much ado um, to help shepherd the questions, but I'm going to take the prerogative to ask the first one if I could. One of the few things I was taught about politics, knowing nothing, was where you stand depends on where you sit, right? So if you're sitting in Denmark and you have all this, you don't have to be the indispensable nation and you have all this marvelous welfare state, you may be very favorable to globalization. If you're sitting in China and the future is bright, you may be very favorable to globalization. Do you think, so do you think that there has to be some sort of intellectual argument or ideological argument to win over some of these people that you're talking about in the US Congress, or is it a question of buying them off? And if it is a question of buying them off, how do we trade off the fact maybe they don't want social welfare, they want another aircraft carrier? How do we evaluate? Oh, that's absolutely right. Uh, two things. I'm, not, I'm talking primarily not about buying them off, us, buying our constituents off, mm -hmm. which you know, is both morally better. I mean, these are people who have the right to it. Um, here's the problem. We haven't yet reached, uh, you, you have a, there, there are two levels of people you have to reach. The harder ones are the ones who ideologically are opposed to any government welfare, et cetera. The ones that we can reach more quickly are those who are well disposed towards this. Democrats, look, a lot of Democrats who voted against trade bills were very uncomfortable with it. I was myself. We don't, we're not the isolationists. We do want to help other people. It is to enable those who want to be more supportive of international cooperation to survive political attacks when they do that. And that would be true on the, uh, and by the way, that would be also true on the Republican side. There are Republicans who privately said to me, no, this is crazy, having the GAO audit the Open Market Committee. Oh, of course we need the IMF. They're afraid of losing primaries. So I would say it's two things. To help the left, those of us who recognize the importance of international cooperation, we need to be able to do things that alleviate social distress. To help the right, the business committee's got to come in and say, we will support you and tell the Republican leadership, you've got to stop this. How can you be telling the uh, Fed not to lend money? I mean, when the Fed lent money to the European Central Bank, if that had come to vote in the House, it would have been repudiated. I mean, which is bizarre, yeah. but look, get people to say to them, are you kidding? You can't do this. Look, look at this. So that's, it would be at that, at that level. Uh, it, it is, uh, and then, you know, there will still be some people who don't do it. Now, part of it is, and this is the great paradox, there was, of course, the people who said, well, why do we spend so much militarily? There was an economic argument that says, um, well, people have said, oh, it's because of the military-industrial complex, what I've now said, et cetera. There is some of that. I believe the larger reason we overspend military is cultural lag. Look, from 1940 to 1990, America was imperiled by very bad, very heavily armed people. I think we may have overreacted towards the end to the communists, but there were the Nazis, there were the communists. We, we, we did this in response. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, that fundamentally changed the world. There were still unpleasant people in the world. People don't like us, but none had the capacity, even theoretically, to destroy our society and our existence as a free people. And George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton acted on that. 
and the military began to go down in the 90s. And it went down, in fact, I have tweaked Leon Panetta, not tweeted, because I don't do that, but I've tweaked him, uh, because he said when he became Secretary of Defense, don't hollow out the military. He said, America always hollows out the military after a war. We did it after World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and we did it after the Cold War. Well, when Leon said we had hollowed out the military after the Cold War, it struck me that that was kind of odd because he was the budget director in the immediate period after the Cold War. So he apparently hollowed out the military. He didn't hollow out the military. We had a perfectly good military in South Yugoslavia and Iraq that was that hollowed out military. But what happened was, I believe, Rick, the neoconservatives were able to use 9-11 to advance an agenda they had long had. There were people who believed that America should have this dominant military posture in the world because it is our mission in the world to preserve order. For some, it's religious. For other, it is greatness in a nation. You know, remember the 19th century mocking of the Little Englanders, or oh, you want to be a nation of shopkeepers, you don't want to have an empire. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm for shopkeepers, um, I, because those are the people who would want to be. But I think what happened was you had people use 9-11 to blow up the terrorist threat. The terrorists are bad people, and they murder people. They murdered Americans. They murdered Africans in, in Tanzania and, and uh, Kenya. But they are not at their most potent, the Soviet Union or Hitler. And you don't defeat terrorists with nuclear submarines. I wish you did, because we have a lot more nuclear submarines than any terrorists. I mean, I'm, I'm told we have to stay with Iraq and Afghanistan. We have to help them because they don't have air forces. Well, neither do anybody is opposing them. Now, that doesn't mean you ignore it altogether. But I think what happened was the neoconservatives built up, and others felt in the terrible shock of the, those mass murders, and then uh, misleading stuff I thought about, about Saddam. And so that became, terrorism became the functional equivalent, the, the moral equivalent, uh, to be William James, uh, of, of the uh, communism and Nazism. What's encouraging me is the American people now know that's not true. Barack Obama was the first Democratic president in memory to debate his Republican opponent and say, I want less military spending than you do and win. The last Democrat to do that was George McGovern. Mike Dukakis, a wonderful guy, was told by his advisors, I know this, don't look like you're soft on defense. That's why Michael, who's a wonderful guy, was in that helmet in the tank and made to look silly because he was being told by people um, not to do this. The American people are ready for this. I offered an amendment with a colleague in the last Congress to hold, to cut back the military budget represented, reported out by the House of Representatives Armed Services Committee. My co-sponsor, the lead sponsor, was the Tea Party Republican from South Carolina, Mick Mulvaney. Now, there's an isolationism there that goes too far, but there is also a, uh, there's a coalition that can be done there. Now, the second thing is people say, oh, well, but it's the weapon system. It is true that the weapon systems, the argument that's bad for the economy, is there. First of all, the argument that we can't cut military spending because it's having a bad macroeconomic effect is really very funny because it comes from people who believe that government spending in general has no economic effect. These are people who I've said, and Paul Krugman said it too, these are, they believe in a sort of armed Keynesianism. Uh, Keynes, only works, <laughs> Keynes only works with guns, but not with uh, housing or roads or anything else. But and I have an easy answer for that. Don't try to cancel an existing weapon system. Everybody knows it is a lot e easier to stop something in the first place before it ever starts than to take it away from people. As I recall, that's why Jeremy Bentham was not a socialist, because under the utilitarian principle, you know, why doesn't that lead to leveling and give everybody, because the pain of losing something is greater than the pleasure of getting it. So that's a rationale for not being a total leveler. Well, I, but I believe we're ready to do that. But those are the two answers, too long an answer. The business community has got to tell the right wing, and we need to do some better things for people in, in the country. Thank you. Um We've got a roving mic, and so, Howard, I'm gonna see if there's people from outside the Institute who want to ask first, so the, the lady over here and the gentleman in back. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Mr. Chairman. I'm Nancy Donaldson with the ILO, and I've had the privilege to work with the IFIs and with the U.S. government in this very dynamic Great Recession period. and. 
What's interesting to me, and this is really a question to you as a longtime policymaker, to come back to you and say, what about this instruments of global um, cooperation that can have a deeper impact? What I saw when the G20 came together in response to the Great Recession was some very powerful instructions to, without a secretariat, to the international institutions like mine to work together. And some of that dynamism that came about in addition to the work that you did was because we had to. We had to learn new ways to work together. But I'm very interested in your thoughts as someone who can help us think about how to do it more powerfully and have more powerful policy cooperation uh, to move some of these agendas. No, I think part of it is the uh, financial regulation. But I think the, the, the undeniable imperative to cooperate on financial regulation to prevent this gaming of people moving here and there, it's a very important incentive towards a degree of, of international coordination, which is, which is happening some. And um, I think that also shows some, some positives uh, for it. So part of the, in fact, I would say this, I think the people who make policy understand it. The problem is the extent to which they are subjected to domestic constraints against doing it. I mean, obviously the key example of that is Germany, where uh, Angela Merkel has to continue to you know, maneuver uh, this way. And um, that's why both of the things I was talking about would be very helpful. And in America, that's fully empowered to do that uh, would, would be uh, the best way. I do believe at this point, and there was, back in the 80s and 90s, you had the, the Washington Consensus. I believe, as I said, it was not simply socially wrong, I think it was economically too rigid. And I think you have now a much better deg degree of understanding about what the policy models are. And it's, I, I think that I would go back, it's almost the same as my answer to Adam's question. You need to do, we need to do a better job of, of providing, not, not, the electorates don't have to demand that this happen. They have to not stop it from happening. That's the key. Uh, Mr. Frank, I'm Alessandro Pio from the Asian Development Bank office in Washington, D.C. Uh, you mentioned the role of international institutions, and one of the high items on our agenda is environmental sustainability, climate change, and the impact that growth has in, in this area. Do you see, we don't hear much debate on this issue here in the United States. Do you see a role for the U.S., both domestically and internationally, to play more of a leadership role in this area, yes. considering also the job potential and the economic growth potential of this. Right. Area. Let me make three points, because your last point pick up. First, I do think that the uh, recent spate of natural, natural disasters has, has given some impetus to uh, climate change. I think you'll find much less skepticism in New York and New Jersey, you know, even among more conservative elements. I think the, the undeniable, the volatility of, of what's been going on um, and the violent impact is important. Secondly, and I go back, and you know, I'm Johnny OneNote here, but one of the problems that I have seen among my friends in the environmental movement is they have not been sensitive enough to the dealing with the jobs trade-off. You're right, of course, that there is a long-term job effect. But I will tell you this in politics, the short term will beat the hell out of the long term, five days out of four. And we, again, need to find ways for people who are losing their current jobs. I mean, that is the, the I think, among other things too, I would urge my environmental friends, let's have some priorities. Climate change is clearly a very high priority. Clean air and clean water are high priorities. Uh, preservation of battlefields, less so. You can't do it all. And I think if we want to muster our ability to go forward on the big ones, people are going to have to be willing to make some, some job-related compromise in the other. But, but the biggest objective, I mean, there are people who don't believe in climate change, and they're just all weird. The biggest obstacle to the specific programs that would help us deal with climate change are the short-term job impacts. Coal obviously being the biggest, and uh, we need to, we need to, uh, to the extent that we can alleviate those concerns and provide better uh, social conditions, you get the support to do that.
And I'll ask, I'll answer quickly. I'm Jim Roberts from the Heritage Foundation. Um, just <laughs> so, a, a, a comment about the disability treaty, actually, the bigger problem with it from our point of view was that it, it wasn't about disability per se. The U.S. has, as you know, some of the best laws protecting disabled people in the world. The problem was one of uh, setting up yet another supernatural national uh, entity uh, and a threat to U.S. sovereignty. I think that How was it a threat to U.S. sovereignty? See, I, just, well, I that's, think that's paranoia. I mean, I really, that's just a sidetrack. My main No, question, it's paranoia. <laughs> uh, I, I, I disagree, but we you could, we could go to, I, I would ask you to our website me. on that. But I, my, my bigger question is about the IMF and the Federal Reserve because I think uh, Americans justifiably are concerned when they see money being sent, maybe, maybe be behind closed doors decisions, to prop up, bail out an, a European social welfare spending machine that is broken down. We spent the morning in this room talking about unsustainability of programs and promises and debt. And why shouldn't the American people How much did it cost the American taxpayer? You said American money being sent. How much do you guys estimate it cost us? We don't know, but how, how is it going to be to unravel or unwind the three or so trillion dollars on the Federal Reserve balance sheet? That's yeah. Yeah. But, a topic for another day. Yes, it, uh, clearly it is. Right, and I will, but I do want to answer it. First of all, I, I do want to stress, and look, this is the debate. I would know, just say to people here, that is obviously the dominant view in the Republican Party today. Uh, as long as it is, don't expect the, you know, it, it, things to be different. Second thing I would say is I do believe it's paranoia when you say it impinges on American sovereignty. Nothing in that convention would interfere with American sovereignty. And you, you raise it and then you brush it off because I don't think there's anything substantive to it. Finally, you don't just sign treaties to improve your own situation. In fact, that might be more of an argument against sovereignty. Part of the reason for a treaty is that you put pressure on other countries to do it. You sign a treaty because you're trying to upgrade the level of activity elsewhere. Uh, but now as to the IMF and the Federal Reserve, um, we didn't do it behind closed doors. We didn't volunteer it. People were free to discuss it. The IMF's intervention, I believe, has been enormously helpful. It has not been of the sort to prop up the social welfare. Anyone who looks at what's going on in Greece or Italy or Spain or Portugal and says you're maintaining the current level of social activity is looking at a different universe. They are clearly undergoing some retrenchment. Maybe it's not enough, maybe it's too much. I do think if you're going to insist on that retrenchment, it is helpful to have ways that ease it as it happens. But no one is arguing that there was, in fact, serious retrenchment going on over there. And again, I would reiterate, you say, how, long, how hard is it going to be to unwind it? Not very hard at all. The people who take your viewpoint have been predicting for several years that the Fed's activities, quantitative easing, et cetera, were going to cause this problem and that problem and the other problem. And I, those arguments have, there's one other issue that those arguments remind me of, same-sex marriage. All of the social chaos that was going to result from my getting married, you've seen as much of that as you have of the negative consequences of inflation and et cetera, et cetera, that you've seen from this very responsible, thoughtful intervention. Thank you.